we're now going to look at how to make alkenes. Making a molecule is often called synthesizing a molecule. And so the tools that are used to make alkenes are called the synthesis of alkenes. How do we synthesize an alkene? We're going to look at two main reactions that are used to do this. We'll learn a couple more in second semester, but I would say these are by far the two most important molecules that are used to make an alkene on demand when we need it. The first one is actually just a review reaction from our previous section of material. It's an E2 elimination reaction, which we discussed in section 9, where we have a halogen leaving group. In the modern organic naming of reactions, they tried to move away from the old-fashioned system where reactions were actually just named after the people who discovered them because those names gave no information about what the actual reaction does. Instead, they started trying to come up with a relatively systematic way to name reactions based on the structural changes that occur in the molecule. That's where this name comes from. In this reaction, what we are doing is we are removing a hydrogen from our beta carbon and a halogen from our alpha carbon while we form the double bond from alpha to beta. So D means to remove, dehydrate, D, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> okay? So we have dehydrogenation, dehydrohalogenation. It's a big looking word, but you can actually break it down and kind of understand what it's saying. This is the observed reaction. If we were doing written exams, I would actually have you start making fast flashcards and memorizing these. But because we're online, we're going to be able to use our notes so you don't actually have to make flashcards and memorize them unless you want to. That may actually prove useful later on when you're studying for standardized exams. But for right now, let's just look at the observed reaction. In our observed reaction, we have a reactant. Technically, it's a substrate. It has a halogen leaving group attached to carbon alpha, and then it has a hydrogen attached to carbon beta, which is adjacent to carbon alpha. We're going to put in a strong base in the form of carbon group O minus and then metal plus cation, which will be a spectator ion. We're actually gonna run this in an alcohol solvent where the carbon group of the alcohol is the same as the carbon group on the alkoxide. So you've seen this, for example, when I did sodium O ethyl over ethyl OH. This is basically a review reaction, so I'm just gonna quickly run through some of the things that we talked about in the last section. We talked about, for example, that steric hindrance in the substrate favors E2 and disfavors SN2. So the more hindered our substrate, the more likely we are to get E2 reaction. We also found that high basicity, lower polarizability nucleophiles like hydroxide ion, alkoxide ion, and even this, which has a nitrogen negative with two carbon groups on it, these tend to favor E2. And finally, we found that protic solvents like alcohols favor E2. If we look at the mechanism, it's a one-step mechanism. The base makes a bond to the beta hydrogen. The beta hydrogen can only have one bond to it, so it lets go of a hydrogen on the other side, which pushes toward the alpha carbon and pushes out the leaving group. We get a transition state like this, and this is our product. We also talked about the regioselectivity of this reaction. Regioselectivity occurs when there are two different beta carbons that could each provide a hydrogen and would give different products that are constitutional isomers of each other. It turns out that there was a rule which determined which beta carbon would be preferred. It was called Zaitsev's rule. 
Zaitsev's rule was originally stated like this. The most substituted alkene would be preferred, the alkene that has the most carbon groups attached. However, it turns out that if you choose the beta carbon that is has the most carbon groups attached, the most substituted beta carbon, that will give you the most substituted alkene. So it can be restated as the most substituted beta carbon is preferred. Here's an example. We have this substrate. We have a beta carbon on this side and a beta carbon on that side. Here's our alpha carbon with our leaving group. We put in our typical sodium ethoxide ethanol reagents, which are going to favor elimination. And what we see is between these two betas, the right-hand beta is the more substituted. So we're going to prefer to remove a hydrogen from that beta, push toward the alpha carbon, push out the chlorine, and get this double bond right here. In contrast, we can use a different base, such as T-butyl oxide, which is sterically hindered because it has such a large carbon group directly next to the oxygen. Sterically hindered bases are going to prefer to remove the, a hydrogen from the less substituted beta because they're going to be more accessible. It's not going to require so much crowding to get in to make a bond to that hydrogen. So therefore, if we remove a hydrogen from the less substituted beta, that would be removing hydrogen from this side, we would get a pair of electrons moving toward alpha, pushing up chlorine, and we would end up with a double bond in a different location from the first reaction. And our product would be a constitutional isomer. This location would be a location that puts a double bond with fewer carbon groups on it. And we call this the Hoffman product. We only get the Hoffman product generally when we have a sterically hindered base. Finally then, there was a required stereochemistry alignment um, for this reaction to proceed. The alignment looks something like this, drawn in a perspective drawing. The leaving group, the alpha carbon, the beta carbon, and the beta hydrogen that is reacting have to all be in very close to the same plane. It doesn't have to be a perfect 180 degrees, but very close. So they have given that term anti-periplanar alignment between beta hydrogen, alpha leaving group. What that does, if we look at a Newman projection of it, it forces the other two groups on each carbon into certain exact locations. And they line up on the same side of the bond axis in an exact precise way. Then when we remove the hydrogen in the leaving group, the molecule just flattens out to create the double bond. Groups that are aligned on the same side of the antiperiplanar plane in the reactant will end up on the same side of the double bond in the product. In other words, they'll end up cis to each other. And so this molecule would produce this product and only this product. It would not produce the stereoisomer. We're now going to look at a new reaction, which is based on E1 elimination. This reaction is called dehydration of alcohols. If we look at our observed reaction, we can see that we start with an alcohol, which has a hydroxyl group attached to a carbon that we will see is our beta car is our sorry our alpha carbon. We then have a carbon adjacent, our beta carbon, and then a hydrogen on that. To make this reaction work, what we're going to do is we're going to use strong acid. The most common strong acid that's used is sulfuric acid, although other strong acids can be used. If we look at the overall process of the reaction, then we remove OH from one carbon, we remove a hydrogen from the other carbon and make a double bond. But if we add together to make the formula of the elements that we removed, we see that we removed an H2O, which is a molecule of water. So when you take water away from something, you are dehydrating it. That's why it's called dehydration. <laughs>
So, any strong acid can be used as our reagent for this, although concentrated sulfuric is probably the most common. And while it's not written, on the product side of the reaction, there is a molecule of water produced. It's a byproduct, we normally ignore it. However, it should be pointed out that this reaction is actually in equilibrium. If we have a high concentration of water, by Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction will begin to push toward the reactant side. And what we will get is incomplete reaction. So in order to favor production of the products, what we want to do is have a low amount of water in our system, and that's why we use concentrated acid, which is a lot of acid and only a little amount of water. Our mechanism in this reaction is what's called an acid-catalyzed E1. So it more or less follows the E1, but we're going to have an extra, extra acid-base reaction step to make our leaving group a better leaving group. Let's talk briefly about what a catalyst is. A catalyst is a species that participates in the reaction. It actually reacts, but it's not ultimately consumed because at some point in the reaction, we get it back. So an acid catalyst would be a situation where we get a hydrogen plus from an acid, but then at the end, we get that hydrogen plus back by deprotonating one of the intermediates. Why do we need acid then? Well, the problem here is that we would like hydroxyl to act as a leaving group. But if we look on the pKa table, we can see that hydroxide ion is a very strong base. It's kind of a really crummy leaving group. So how are we going to make it more reactive as a leaving group? Well, what we can do is put in acid, have the hydroxyl do acid-base reaction with our strong acid so that it reaches out, grabs a hydrogen plus, and forms this molecule. Now, in this molecule, if you look, we no longer have a hydroxyl group, an OH group, as a leaving group. Instead, what we have is OH2 positive charge. So that's basically a water that is currently attached to something else. But if we look on the pKa table, water is very high up in the base column. It's a very weak base. And so that could break away as a very stable low potential energy water leaving group. So by putting in the acid, we convert our reactant from having a very poor leaving group into having a much better leaving group, which will allow it then to do the rest of the reaction. So the rest of the reaction proceeds as follows. Once we convert a hydroxyl into a good leaving group, the leaving group will then break off of the molecule. That will form a molecule of water. We will also form a carbocation here. Now because we have a carbocation, this species can rearrange. Once it's done rearranging, wherever the carbocation ends will be the alpha carbon, and then the adjacent carbon will be the beta carbon, and we'll be interested in a hydrogen on the beta carbon. At that point, some species that will act like a base will come over, make a bond to the beta hydrogen, Beta hydrogen will have to let go of a pair of electrons on the other side, which will flow towards alpha and make our new double bond alpha to beta. Notice that in the first step, we use up an, a hydrogen plus by deprotonating an acid, but at the end, we take a hydrogen plus back and put it back on and regenerate the acid. That's why it's catalytic. The fact that this molecule has a carbocation is very important because there can be skeletal rearrangements in the course of the reaction that give us a product with a different skeleton from our reactant. Here's an example. If we look, this would be our reactant alcohol. It has this t-butyl looking portion of its skeleton. However, if we look at the product, 
these are not t-butyl-like, they're more like isopropyl-like. How did this happen? Well, let's just walk through the mechanism really quickly. In our first step, the hydroxyl group makes a bond to the hydrogen of the acid, and, it, and the hydrogen of the acid lets go of a pair of electrons, which goes on to the rest of the conjugate base. That creates this species, which effectively has a water molecule now attached. The water molecule is very stable. It breaks off of the rest of the molecule, leaving an empty space and a carbocation. This particular carbocation is secondary. By moving this pair of electrons over, plus the methyl group, we can create an empty space on this adjacent carbon, which would be tertiary. That would be more stable. So that, that is the driving force for a rearrangement, moving this bond to here, along with the carbon group. At this point then, since we now have a tertiary carbocation, it won't want to rearrange anymore. So we'll call that carbocation carbon our alpha carbon. And what will happen is we will then take a hydrogen away from one of the betas. Now this um, process follows Zaitsev's rule. So if we look at our betas, we have two betas that are equivalent and are both primary. And then we have a third beta, which is tertiary. So Zaitsev's rule says we would prefer to remove a hydrogen from the tertiary beta. So a pair of electrons comes up, or sorry, the base uses its lone pair to come over, remove that beta hydrogen, a pair of electrons is let go on the other side, it flows toward the alpha, and we get our new double bond from alpha to this beta one carbon.